Welcome to Writers Speak, dedicated to the written word and those who produce it. I am your host and author of two historical fictions, She Flew Bombers and She Built Ships During World War II. Today in the studio, I would like to welcome Jeff Cotton. Welcome to Writers Speak, Jeff. Hey, Jeannie. It's nice to be on Writer Speak because this one's not quite about the written word so much as it is the spoken word. Well, I know that you have written a manual, but yeah. we are going to mostly talk about your training courses. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff Cotton has a marriage and family license. He is a trainer with the National Foster Parent Association and has worked with children and families for 35 years. He's conducted seminars for child care associations, including group homes, residential treatment programs, foster family agencies, and schools throughout the United States. Wow, you have been working hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love the trainings, and so they aren't work for me. Honest to God, when people say, when will you retire? Well, never. Why would you retire Good for something for that you. one loves doing? <laughs> yeah. I like to hear that. Yeah. Could you tell us what inspired you to go into this professional field in the first place? Uh, what drew me in was initially I was working with alcoholics, and then I was a supervisor kind of in a low-income project area, and there were these... There were these four kids, this one kid, Tommy, who had busted his hand up, smashing a brick wall when he was angry. And at first, I didn't get my connection to me in him. I just thought, that is really weird. But then when I saw the part of me that wanted to hit a wall when I was angry or clear a desk off, then I could see the humanness of this. But these four kids, I kind of became a big brother to in a certain way. And kind of, there was a gravitational toward kids and when I moved to California, that was then the first job I got. I worked at a program called Bachman Hill School. So it has always been uh, latency, teenage boys and girls, both, more boys than girls. But that was the passion. It was kids, I think, because they were just forming in, and there was such an exciting time of they're not fully rooted in anywhere. They're not stuck in their past. They have a chance to do something different. So that became, I think, the gravitational pull of, yeah, Kids were interesting. It has a passion. I mean, most of us, Jeannie, wouldn't do anyone else's job. I mean, most of us would not do anyone else's job. But and it's always good to know why one does that job. And we yeah. always need people to be doing all these jobs. Yeah, from passion. Yeah. 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 I actually met a man one day. I never met him before. And I said, well, what do you do? He said, well, I work with schizophrenics and kids in group homes. I said, oh, so you're working on your insanity in your childhood. <laughs> and he stopped for a second. He said, I am. I mean, he was shocked. But it was like, as opposed to big surprise, how do we end up here? Well, I came in to heal my own childhood, honestly. Mm -hmm. You know, and that was a part of what I came in to heal was my yeah. own childhood. And in that, as I healed mine, was able to work with them and heal theirs and mm -hmm. became quite mutual. I've, I've heard other therapists say that. It's always very interesting. I know you're also the author of the training manual, Skillful De-Escalation with Children, Approaching Fear Without Fear, certified by the State of California for group homes and residential treatment programs. But let's talk about your amazing training classes. Sweet. Okay. They started Back in 85, I had been working with kids for a few years, and then I became a supervisor. So in that, it wasn't my job anymore to be good with the kids. It was my job to help people find themselves being good with the kids. So in that, it gave me a language on this that I never had before, all the stuff I was doing intuitively. But also, they were the trainings I needed. I mean, that is really true. No one taught me how to have a confrontation and keep a relationship, that either we were in war or we were friends. And that's an art for any couple, is how do you have a battle and stay connected? So they were the trainings I needed, but also the language was, how do I teach someone new to this field what to bring to this party? I mean, I hired someone in 1979, one sentence out of her mouth, had never worked with kids before, but she had two kids. I said, well, what do you have to bring to the party? And she said, love and care, and I'll fight like hell. And I said, 
Yep, hired, because you get the right order. Love and care was the right order. You know, yeah. people say tough love, tough love. Well, the emphasis on, you know, it's, the tough is okay if the emphasis is on the love, but if it's mm -hmm. just on being tough, that helps no one. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it became this honor of being able to talk about how to be in relationship with yourself, not just with children, but in the end, how staff can form a relationship with themselves first as a way to, you know, the necessary precondition of all relationship with all others. Could you tell me what is mandated training? Huh. Mandated training for professionals in the state of California, including therapists, group home staff, um, foster parents, nurses, teachers, anyone who's in a profession generally needs every year or two years to have a certain number of hours to A, learn new stuff, uh, but so it isn't just hopefully just to renew their license, but actually to learn stuff, to learn new things about themselves. I mean, so to they, grow in their profession. Yeah, and to yeah. grow in themselves too, to be uh -huh. different and show up. I mean, mm -hmm. so to have someone who's still passionate about this stuff, being able to talk to people about, you know, that these that these aren't just mandated because you're supposed to, but. If we come in and want to learn about us, people stay in the field for the right reason longer because they get their growing too, rather than just helping these poor kids grow. Mm -hmm. It's great that uh, nurses can take your training and um, receive um, continuing educational credits. Yeah, nurses can, MFTs, marriage family therapists, uh -huh. licensed clinical social workers can, group home administrators can, counselors can. There, there are four different licensing boards involved in, in this um, process so that... Mm -hmm. How long um, is the uh, training class usually? Anywhere generally from two hours. They could be as long as eight hours, but I tell you, Jeannie, I'm not a fan of anything over six. By that last two hours of the day, from four to five in the mm -hmm. afternoon, I mean, people are just zoned. And the last thing I want people is leaving is exhausted from a training rather than enlivened. So. Renewed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. You know, sometimes I laugh. I do a training called Burnout Renewal. I said, well, there won't be any time to renew you, but I promise to burn you out. <laughs> you know, and in that moment, yeah. because I want people leaving renewed rather than walk out of a burnout renewal training and burnt out. It's like that's antithetical to the training. Mm -hmm. Where are the trainings usually held? Many times in individual group homes. I was recently up in Sacramento where about 14 different group homes you know, brought me to a, a church, uh, and that was nice. Um, yeah, many times state organizations have them, and so they'll have them at different conferences or hotels. Um, so they are these different venues for mm -hmm. people. What I loved reading is you felt one of the most important ingredients in your training classes is a good sense of humor. Oh, yeah. To shake it off, <laughs> to not get too nuts. I was in Colorado recently. They asked me to do burnout renewal with about 50 people. At the end, I asked people, what was the most important thing? First three people in a row said the humor. I mean, right away, because when we're burnt out, nothing's very funny. <laughs> you know, we're stuck in this. But if we can laugh it off, shake it off, okay, this is nutty, you know, as hell, but, oh, let me not get too caught up in, in the seriousness or the drama of this stuff, because that doesn't help. You know, to look at kids and not be able to shake it off and be able to laugh with them about stuff, not laugh at them, but laugh with them, that helps everyone. What uh, type of group was that? That was uh, child care workers who were working in an on-ground school, and they had been involved in a number of restraints, and the staff was just overextended, oh. burnt out, irritated. And, you know, when a show of hands, how many people are burnt out? Most of the room raised their hands. I mean, most mm -hmm. of them did. And the other were probably on morphine drips. Mm. Kidding. So you were a pretty important ingredient to throw there. Uh. <laughs> Well, to play with them. I mean, yeah. just to play with the whole issue is fun. Just to have somebody come in and, and it's like lighten up. This is like nutty and it's okay. Don't get too crazy. I was doing a training on anger, rage, and trauma with about 150 people. I mean, that's the title. Anger, rage, trauma. Not uh, a very light subject. And I came yeah. in and I said, look it, I just saved a kid's life last week. And the people said, yeah. I said, yeah, I took my hands from around his throat. Welcome to the training. I mean, in that moment, then people just busted up because, oh, good. Someone's <laughs> going to add water on top of this because I've seen people who are funny and I don't remember what the point is and I've seen people who are serious and they just were awful to listen to 
So on some level, I consider myself a lunatic with a point, is that I definitely have a point, and there's a lot of humor just imbued in it because it's funny too. Jeff, we'd love to hear you demonstrate some of uh, some of your training uh, classes, and we have this lovely, magnificent purple chart here. That how many years have you been <laughs> using this chart? Some version of this chart for probably about the past five years. And when I say it's up at every training I do, that's no kidding because I find it the most interesting thing that I've really put together. Okay, what this is is essentially the training of of out of balance. And the out of balance would be aggressive, passive, right, wrong, winner, loser, predator, prey, <laughs> victimizer, victim. And if you take a look at domestic violence, domestic violence is driven by someone who feels like a piece of crap underneath, who feels really small, who monsters up to take control of you. They don't have control over themselves, so their consolation prize is trying to take control of others. What's, you know, homicidal rage? Driven by someone who doesn't want to feel small, who then gets really ugly about it. Oppositional kids are driven by, if I'm not in control, then I'm being controlled. If I'm not right, then I'm wrong. If I'm not powerful, then I'm powerless. Because these two things are fear-driven. See, aggressive, I'm stuck in no. You try to tell me what to do, I'm going to oppose that. Compliant kids are stuck in yes, tell me what to do. Neither one are real. They're not actually making a decision. The only one that's actually making a decision is assertion that says yes and no, and it's situational. This is why it's the witness position. It's a response because this is the only one that's reflective. These two things are reactive, but they're reactive out of fear. And so it's important. I mean, what heals the planet to me? Three things heal the planet. One is good, rock solid, here I stand communication about me, as I am, no deal. Part two of that is being able to own what's going on inside me. Because you see, once I'm convinced, for instance, that the Republicans are creating my fear, the Democrats are creating it, the Tea Party is creating it, the economy is creating it, once I'm convinced anything outside of me is doing it, two things happen at once. I feel powerless because look what it's doing to me. And now I get into wars to try to control it because look what it's doing to me. Like if I looked at you and said, you know, um, you know, Gary, the, 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 the producer, he's driving me crazy, then every intervention I'm trying to make is to change him because look what he's doing to me. The only way out of hell is to be able to look and say, right now I'm nuts around Gary. He comes in the room and I go crazy. At least I get I'm in prison rather than he put me in one. So this is really a training about good self-responsibility around how we see things. And these two things are in roles. Assertion's the only one that's in a relationship. Here I am, who are you? It makes great space for you to be who you are. Why? Because I'm making great space for me to be who I am. These things, the drag about aggression is that it tries to claim other people's space to be. The drag about passive is it doesn't even claim our own space. Assertion is the only one that claims here I stand as I am. So learning how to use skillful words is important, but the skillful words I'm talking about isn't just on other people, they're on ourselves too. In other words, am I a jerk, an idiot, a moron when I make a mistake? See, now I've trashed the relationship to myself. You know, I could, how could I have been so stupid? You see, now I've dishonored me a whole lot rather than, boy, that was unskillful. Boy, let me take that one again. A friend of mine who's a great trainer, she has one of those clipboards that, the, that produces you take two, take three, that, that mm -hmm. kind of She said, there are no mistakes in life. There's just a mistake. Take it again. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for me, this chart is about how do I stand here? What happens for me? I mean, to assert, assert a statement about chocolate ice cream, for instance, is not chocolate's the bomb, because if I said chocolate's the best and vanilla sucks, I mean, at the moment, do you even agree with that? You know, and in this moment, we can be in a power struggle about chocolate ice cream because I haven't added to me. Chocolate's my favorite flavor. You see, there's no arguing with I love chocolate. There's a huge argument that everybody should love chocolate and anyone who doesn't is an idiot. Or, oh, I like chocolate, but I guess I'm kind of crazy and weird. See, this one doesn't own itself. This one tries to claim the whole truth for everyone else. Assertion's the only one that is real. And that means the more that we tell a truth of who we are, the more real we become. So for a number of years, I would look at 
counselors in group homes and I would say, well, how do you feel about that? And I would get this blank look. And suddenly I realized, well, the reason that was is because most of us in the Helping Act were codependent as hell. We came in to help poor little them. We came in to help someone who wasn't as well as us. But the truth is, everyone knows grief. Everyone knows betrayal. Everyone's been betrayed and been on the other end of it. I mean, the whole D.A.R.E. program thing is oh, D.A.R.E. to keep kids off drugs. You know, D.A.R.E. to keep yourself off them. I mean, I don't know anyone who isn't addicted to something, the cell phone, the TV, you know, food, alcohol, pot, the, you know, being right, whatever it is, is that the more I know about addiction within me, the more useful I am to you because the empathy is what heals the planet. So three things heal the planet. Good rock solid here I stand communication. Part two is owning what's going on inside of me, moment to moment, owning me, knowing me. And part three is being in relationship with you, not which role are we going to be in, who's dominant, who's submissive, who's right, who's wrong. That's just a power struggle that goes nowhere. The only way to heal something is finally, okay, here I am, who are you? And the more we're willing to claim our space to be, the more permission we give other people to be because we have finally at least made ourselves real. And that's what good communication is, how I healed myself. Because I came from a family where there was very little space for us to be us. My three brothers more went numb on some level, you know, and I over showed up. I was out of control because I wasn't going to be contained by anybody. It took me a long time to come here, to come into the middle. But when I landed here and talked about the truth here, then I became real. The more I focus on you and what you're doing and what you ought to be doing, the more real you become, and then we get lost. So there's an art to claiming our own space, and in that moment, it gives other people that art too. So I'm a huge fan of doing trainings with organizations. I do some very, very good things on burnout and renewal, which people need, but great mm -hmm. communication and great listening. When people ask about good communication, the first training I want to teach is listening. Two ears, one mouth, good reason. Mm -hmm. Learn how to ask great questions. Stop giving so much advice. And, and you know, if you have a problem for me to ask, is that anything you even want advice about? And you may say, no. And then it's like, oh, great. Then let me hear you. Then you become real because I want to hear your truth rather than I want to help you and fix you and change you and do something to for or about you. I mean, these trainings were very real because I was codependent, wrapped up in doing them, and I burnt out two different times in the first three years I started doing trainings. No kidding. Went and worked in a health food store for a little while. That was nice. Didn't have to restrain <laughs> anyone in the tofu aisle or anything, <laughs> but went in and burnt again because I did not know how to take care of me simultaneously to taking care of you. Uh -huh. It was either you or me. This one is you and me. So it sees us in relationship, and that's an art to me of good communication. So that's in a nutshell. That's, that's kind of a yeah. quick version of uh, what I talk about. That made it very clear. Okay. I really wanted to um, uh, read a few of these items Great. that are in uh, Jeff Cotton trainings. These, these, these are training topics that you'll be doing. Yes. Um, uh, Jeff talks about 10 habits of highly successful parents and professionals, communication anchored in truth, the astonishing listening training, which you were talking about, skillful engagement with crises, activating the best in children, what to do when buttons get pushed, how to speak with children about difficult things, being therapeutic with sexual minority youth, burnout and renewal, internal inoculation from external pressure, creating healthy teams and partnerships, understanding attachment and child development, how to help children become thoughtful decision makers, living anxiety free in anxious times. Yeah. I really liked the last one. Oh, sweet. Yeah. <laughs> and they're hard fought. They were really hard fought. Great back, topics. Mm -hmm. Back in 85, if I may, I went to Codependence Anonymous, not because I was in relationship with alcoholics. I was in relationship with a helping act in a way that was not helpful. It was like personal mission to save somebody else, and I didn't know how to save myself. So I went to Codependence Anonymous, and 
I was hanging out with people who were uh, in relation with alcoholics and addiction and all that. I was in relationship in the Helping Act in the same way. I was addicted to being helpful. And in fact, one of the newer trainings that's not listed there is called Breaking the Addiction to Being Helpful. Because it doesn't, if the more helpful I am, the more helpless you remain. It doesn't help you so much. If you come to me for great advice and you trust me and you don't trust yourself, if when you go out in the world, I want you to trust yourself. So in that, the trainings are really aimed to help people become themselves, both the professionals who help kids and for the kids that we help to become real, to become themselves. Well, Jeff, it was a pleasure having you on Writer Speak and learning about your trainings. Thank you for um, telling us all about them, and uh, we have learned a great deal. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Jeannie. So there's a website, Jeff Cotton Trainings, that will be listed on here. Go to yes. the site, and you can find out more about these in detail. Writers Speak is produced at the Community Media Center of the North Bay. I would like to thank our sponsor, the Sonoma County Gazette. Please join us next time for another episode with a talented author.